Uh, we have had just an embarrassment of riches with the, the kinds of attendance to the Botticelli exhibition. But you should tell your friends that as of 9 p.m. on April 5th, it will be done. And I think that we're going to put out some things sort of, you know, when it gets to be the last week uh, to try to focus on that. So many people said they would like to see it, but we realized that today is the 14th. And when it ends the 5th, we've already sold out over a week ago all the soft cover catalogs and all this, even the signed soft, soft cover catalogs. That's 500 books just about, plus hard covers that Mary Grace is now selling very successfully. And that, that's a nice indicator of success. Um, we had an op-ed in the Richmond paper. Not, we've had three stories out of the Richmond paper. We had an op-ed last week from a fellow who's come down and seen the show and he had the audacity to say that the Botticelli show was the greatest art exhibition ever organized in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So, I can make up things and delude myself all the time, but uh, when, when they write it down, uh, you know. The other great thing last week was on Friday afternoon, an article came out on one of the greatest of the art websites called Artsy. I don't know if you all read this, but so far now we've been on them all. Artnet News, Bluen, Artfix Daily, Arts Daily, now Artsy. That's besides a feature story, in the, you know, the Wall Street, Wall Street Journal. So it's, like I said, it's just been an embarrassment of riches. But as a result, this Artsy article, it was very interesting because um, I thought it was very, very well done. And if anybody can go to it and read it, there is a bit of disclosure in there that the, that the woman who's an editor at Artsy was an intern of ours who graduated in 2011. And when I forwarded this, everybody on the staff said, well, I guess it does behoove us to treat them well. <laughs> so they'll be running the world soon when it comes to the message out there. But it was a fantastic, fantastic sort of uh, punch in the arm. And as a result, I've been getting things from all over the world, uh, people congratulating us. And it's just been sort of just impossible. But we couldn't do any of this without you all support, without the support of our board, uh, with the college, and without the support of places like MCB Foundation and VCU. Uh, there's no one here tonight to talk about them, but we can't thank them enough for this, the underwriting and support of this program. The topics in architecture are usually called First Tuesdays. Then you'll re realize this is the third Tuesday, and there's another program on Thursday called The Third Thursday, where John Spike will be speaking again about Botticelli and his uh, friends and contemporaries in painting. Um, we've had to, and we've taken to uh, streaming these programs over Facebook Live. Um, sometimes there's over 100 people watching us, and you can also save them up and watch them again, uh, or at a different time, but there are people that are watching them live, so we appreciate that. Um, I can safely say that now all the documents have been signed, and Cesar Pelli is going to be the architect of the museum. Jerry Howe, who's on our board, is uh, head of the Buildings Committee. And as you know, David is not only on the board as well, but he's, kind of, he's chair of the, of the Campaign Committee. And I know we have several other board members here tonight, so you know, thank them as well. They've been involved for a long time. Thank the staff. I mean, the staff has just been so fantastic when you have things every night of the week, uh, every night every, on every weekend. Uh, staff is working on the weekends and working at night. The guards uh, are fantastic. Uh, we've had nothing but so so positive experience with the Botticelli. And I'll leave you with this before David comes uh, up and talks to you about Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, we are ahead in Leonardo uh, right now. We're, we're finishing up. As of, on Friday, we're going to do a little point and see where we are. You know, attendance is not everything. It's, it's maybe not even much of anything, but it is an indicator of something. So uh, when you have people writing you, telling you that they've been so moved in the galleries and they can't believe how beautiful these things are, uh, we're just so gratified and proud that our university is befitting bring an exhibition of the stature and quality to our community that we just you know, can't imagine. Where it gets to be difficult is when people start asking what we're going to do next. It doesn't mean next, next, like three weeks, four weeks from now next, but you know, next, next on this scale. And so you know what? I'm going to be quiet about that for a while because we are planning things for when the new museum opens and we hope to uh, intrigue everybody with big ambitious things then. So thank you all so very much. Remember to thank MCV Foundation and ECU. Put on your calendar, first Saturday in May is Wine and Run for the Roses Wine Auction event on Derby Day. That's our big tented fundraiser out front. And the second day after that is the Bluegrass uh, Blues 
and Brews, which is a community engagement day in the same tent out front. Fantastic food and fantastic time, and you'll start getting emails about it. But David, I don't want to keep you back from your handouts here, so uh, I need to get my copy, but thank you so much. Well, good evening, everybody. I, as I usually do, Sarah Gunn, can you hear me in the back? Yeah, thank you. All right, great. Uh, I always like to check in. She's my sound check technician. Um, anyway, uh, welcome to this spring's second lecture in our Selected Topics in Architecture series. We do this every spring. Um, as I mentioned last month, we're going to do a sequence of two lectures now, uh, tonight and then again next month on the influence of Frank Lloyd Wright. Tonight I'm going to discuss the influence he had on a number of architects that were working in the suburbs of Sydney, Australia in the 1950s and 1960s, and that's part of the reason why you have this um, handout. Uh, you might want to refer to that a little bit later as we start going through some works. Um, but then next month, on April 11th, Professor Ed Peace of William & Mary will be here to look at an aspect of Wright's, fluent, of Wright's influence domestically, and in particular on the work of the American architect E. Fay Jones and his acclaimed Thorn Crown Chapel and some of his other works. Well, I can tell you, while we were developing the program for this spring, Ed and I decided on this sequence of Wright, but I think we maybe forgot just one item in the sequence. Maybe we should have squeezed in a third Wright lecture. And that lecture would have been just a refresher course on who Frank Lloyd Wright was and why it's important to these topics that Ed and I decided to bring uh, forward to you all. Um, and so we're going to start uh, tonight just reviewing a bit about the work of Frank Lloyd Wright as it pertains to um, the, tonight's conversation. And who knows, Ed may take you through a few of his different projects in advance of his full discussion next month on April 11th. So anyway, Frank Lloyd Wright, as um, some of you know, uh, was born in the 19th century. He was born in 1867 in Wisconsin, and he died at the age of 91 in 1959. He had a very long and productive career, and really is regarded as just about the most important American architect uh, of all time. His well-known projects include a variety of institutional buildings. You're looking at some of them here. The Johnson Wax Building in Racine, Wisconsin. Of course, the Guggenheim Museum in Manhattan. Uh, Unity Temple in Chicago. These are some of his institutional projects, but he also was productive in the realm of residential architecture over the course of seven decades. His first individual project started in the early 1890s, and he was still putting pen to paper for residential projects uh, when he died in 1959, and some of those projects weren't even fully completed until after his death. He started his work in the uh, Chicago firm of Adler and Sullivan. That was Louis Sullivan's firm. And he always in later times called uh, Louis Sullivan his Liebermeister, his, uh, his great teacher. He spent five years at Adler and Sullivan before striking out on his own in 1893. And he began to develop his own ideas about architecture and in particular about residential architecture. So one of his earliest projects was the Winslow House in suburban Chicago. And he described that as his first prairie style house. And so to get us started with tonight's discussion, I wanted to just read you a paragraph from a book uh, by John Sargent on Wright's residential projects. And this really will, um, will flow nicely into uh, our later discussion. So here's what uh, Sargent wrote. The dwelling of the 20th century would be a very different matter without the work of Wright. The prairie houses countered the maelstrom of social and technological change in America before the First World War by emphasizing rootedness and the security of hearth and family. They did this with a platform and imagery which both shocked taste of the day and became an important component of the ethos of modern architecture. They possess an alluring blend of monumentality, engineering skill, 
and reflections of Japanese architecture and the arts and crafts movement. The Usonian houses endeavored to realize similar goals for the smaller budgets and much changed conditions of the time of the Second World War. So we're going to walk through a sequence of these prairie houses and then roll into some of these Usonian houses um, just to give you a flavor of what Wright was doing and how that impact was, um, was resonating in places like Australia. So Wright had a number of guidelines he used in designing houses, stemming from his ideas that um, architecture of shelter should be organic and it also should be individual. He was not going to be the person who put up a cookie cutter block of houses that all looked, like, looked the same. He was certainly not going to be the architect of a place like Levittown. He wanted architecture to grow from its site, but he also wanted it to have a quiet profile, especially residences. For Wright, uh, roofs should have gentle slopes with broad overhangs. Materials should be natural, should be used in a way that stressed its natural origins, and all aspects of the house should be integrated as a whole. So every house to him, all the pieces and components were very tightly woven together into a complete work of art. So Winslow House, which we looked at in the previous slide, was a first step, but in opposition to Wright's own proclamations, many Wright scholars consider this house, the Willits House, to be his first true prairie-style house. Well, the Darwin Martin House in Buffalo is considered to be one of his great works. Here, Wright begins to blur the distinction between interior and exterior space, and that really became one of the hallmarks of his residential design work. Roby House, uh, anybody visited Roby House in the room? As you all know, it basically sits on the campus of the University of Chicago, which is in and of itself a great collection of architecture, modern architecture, uh, and also some revival architecture. It's really one of his finest early prairie style houses. You can see here the windows in long bands, which became one of his trademarks. You can see these long, low, flat roofs. And generally speaking, even though this is a three-story house, it's a low profile in the neighborhood. Taliesin in Spring Green, Wisconsin, was Wright's own residence and also the site of his first architectural school. Um, here Wright invited architectural fellows to study alongside him, to work with him on projects that came through his practice. It was really sort of a uh, apprenticeship type operation, and that's something he worked on. Uh, that's a that's a scheme he worked with uh, throughout his career. Uh, once he got this thing started in Spring Green, how many people have been to Falling Water? Good. That one's close by. You've got to get to that one if you haven't been there. One of his most iconic works, almost at one with nature, it sits there elevated and perched right above that waterfall in the Bear Run stream, deep in the forest in a beautiful western Pennsylvania setting. So right at Taliesin in Spring Green, Wisconsin, and in 1937, if he bought the land in 1935, but by 1937 he was creating a second school, so to speak, um, in Scottsdale, Arizona, called Atelius and West. Um, and here, it, what's interesting about this building, and this may not be the greatest photograph to show it, this building really sort of emerges out of the landscape. It is very much at one with that desert landscape that, um, that it's sited in. So as the country struggled through the Depression and the lead up to World War II, Wright began to see the need for making this innovative and artistic shelter maybe a bit more affordable, affordable to people of more limited means. Remember, you know, he's working, uh, a good chunk of his career is running in the 20s and 30s, and that is a rough time, a rough economic time in America, uh, not to mention around the world, but for an architect who's looking for commissions, uh, this was not a decade or a decade and a half when a lot of people were building houses. And so he called these things Usonian houses. It was deeply dedicated to making architecture more affordable in his final decades of his life. And he really was attempting to bring forth all of this organic spirit um, on a more limited budget. And so we're looking here at um, one of the corners of the Jacobs House in Madison, 
I think, a really fine example of the Usonian style. Not all Usonian houses were small. This is the Rosamond House in Alabama. Uh, all of the houses, though, had this honesty of materials that set them apart from other architecture. As always with Wright, topography was um, very important in the creation of a house and just uh, pretty much a key determinant on what the architectural expression would ultimately be. The outdoor space around Wright's houses became increasingly linked to interior spaces as his style developed over the years. Um, I think you can see that clearly in this house from New Jersey. Uh, interestingly, this house, uh, due to repeated flood risks, was moved just a couple of years ago to the site of the Crystal Bridges Museum in Arkansas. Reconstructed, beautifully restored. This is it at Crystal Bridges. You're looking at it. Um, so if you're ever in Arkansas visiting that fine museum, you'll get to spend a half day in this building as well. And then even in one of Wright's last projects, he continued to underscore the match of materials to the site. So here we are now out in the desert in the mountains outside of Phoenix, and he's completely set aside his typical wood and brick construction and has gone with a masonry block that I think you'll agree with me is much more reflective of sort of the rock of the desert, but also uh, in some ways the adobe that you might find in more Native American structures um, out in that particular area. Now, we obviously could spend weeks discussing Wright. Just wanted to give you a quick refresher before we delved into our discussion on his influence on the work in Australia. I wanted to be sure we remembered what flavor his influence might take. So now let's move on to Australia. So here we are looking at Australia. Uh, after several decades of rising nationalism, the six colonies of the Australian continent joined together on January 1st, 1901. So before that, six separate colonies, the beginning of the 20th century, we had a new country on that continent in the South Pacific. And with unification, there was a real urgency to begin to more crisply define a culture that was quote unquote Australian. Many architectural practitioners believed that the new country was mired in a repeating sequence of revivalism, of eclecticism, really uncertain of what direction to take for the future. And so in an effort to confront that situation, Australian architects and builders were in constant surveillance of international developments in the field to better understand what the architectural advances were that were taking place around the world. So, what did they look to? Foreign publications were an important source of information, but increasingly architects sought information directly from colleagues who had been exposed to this work through overseas travel, personal overseas travel. The quest for an Australian architecture was part of the new country's efforts to define just what exactly it meant to be Australian. The country had many similarities to the United States. So, colonial past, its limited history, a vast geography, abundant natural resources. But it didn't want to be America part two. It wanted to chart its own course and be recognized as a unique place on the world stage. And really, architecture, as you might imagine, as you're building a country, was intended to be part of the national definition. So what were they looking for? The new Australian style for residential architecture was expected to exhibit a fresh and modern sensibility. After all, this is a young country coming of age, really, in the 20th century, but should also reflect key values and conditions that were considered to be Australian. So the style that was sought was expected to sit comfortably in a natural setting. Remember, this is a vast continent with really the population concentrated in two cities, in um, Sydney and Melbourne, and then, really, aside from some, a few smaller cities around the, around the continent at that point in time, it was a vast open space. So it needed to sit well in the natural setting, and it needed to also have features that both took advantage of the climate, but mitigated some of the impacts of the climate, like that relentless southern sun that Australia is so famous for. 
So Australians gave significant attention to European modernism in the interwar years and after the end of World War II. A number of young architects worked abroad in Europe following their early architectural training in Australia and were exposed to that ongoing conversation about functionalism and the evolution of what came to be known as the international style. And I'm sure some of you were here a couple of years ago. We had a good long conversation about the international style and how um, modernism developed in America. So here's a couple of key buildings. So when these architects returned to Australia, the experiences informed their own stylistic development. But in general, I have to say they weren't dogmatic in their reference to European design themes. A couple of uh, key teachers of architecture in Australia, Sydney Anker and Robin Boyd, um, were talking modern architecture all the time. Um, there were others. So the first architect to fully embrace the functionalist international style in its most pure sense and really to land it on Australian shores was a gentleman named Harry Seidler. So here you're seeing Harry on the right um, and Walter Gropius on the left on a visit by Gropius to Australia in 1954. Well, Seidler was born in 1923 and his family escaped the Nazi occupation of Austria and eventually settled in Australia. But before getting there himself, Seidler took a bit of a detour. He earned an architecture degree in Canada. He then went on to the Harvard Graduate School of Design, where he studied under both Walter Gropius and Marcel Breuer until about 1946. Afterward, he worked in Breuer's New York office until 1948. And then interestingly, he detoured to South America on his way back to Australia in 1948 and spent four months in the office of, guess who, Oscar Niemeyer in Rio de Janeiro. So with this full education in the methods of the Bauhaus from the masters, Gropius and Breuer, and a refinement of his modern sensibilities through work experience with both Breuer and Niemeyer, Seidler brought to Australia a refined and informed modern aesthetic. So upon arrival in Sydney, he was given three quick commissions by his family to build houses for them on a compound in suburban Sydney in an area called Warunga. Really, together they represent the purest distillation of Bauhaus principles and the strong influence of Breuer. I think you'll see that as we uh, take a look at these next few images. So in rapid succession, he designed the Rose Seidler house for his mother in 1948. And then the Rose House for his brother Marcel in 1949, and the Marcus Seidler House for his uncle, also in 1949. Once built, these houses were an immediate sensation. Um, people came from all around and trampled the grounds on the weekend just to get a look at these three houses clustered so closely together. The Rose Seidler House, the first one we looked at, was given the Solman Prize, which is the most prestigious prize in architecture at the time in Australia, and it quickly became an icon. Well, one of the reasons that Seidler's important, and I think you're not seeing any Frank Lloyd Wright in his work, and this is sort of the good counterpoint I wanted to highlight for you, one of the reasons why Seidler is important is that his house has sparked a broadening of the discussion around what exactly constituted an architecture that was, quote unquote, Australian. While the residential designs of other modernists had typically been married very carefully to the landscape, Seidler's houses were viewed by some as having an awkward and a somewhat unnatural relationship with their sites. And so some architects, while fully aware of what was going on in Europe, began to move decidedly away from the more generic internationalism and gradually embraced an aesthetic that was more regional and organic in its roots and clearly derivative of Frank Lloyd Wright. So a group of architects, we're going to talk about these three tonight, followed similar paths, and Robin Boyd, that noted architect, author, and critic that I talked about earlier, retrospectively labeled their collective efforts as the Sydney School in an article he wrote for the June 1967 issue of Architecture Australia. Recognizing a confluence of 
individual approaches to residential architecture in Greater Sydney in the 1950s and 1960s. So in Boyd's mind, the Sydney School approach to architecture was not specifically right in, but rather it embraced a more traditionalist and organic approach to aesthetics, characterized by a pronounced use of brick, of timber, and other natural materials. The reality was, though, even though Boyd said they weren't trying to be right in, the reality was that many of the architects that fell into the category of Boyd's Sydney School were captivated by Wright's approach and the remarkable fit that it had to the Australian question. So like I said, today we're going to focus on these three architects. They all fit into Boyd's Sydney School definition. Their work, I think you'll find and agree with me, suggests the strong influence of Wright. Peter Muller, our first architect, arrived at Wright's doorstep without having studied Wright specifically, so he claims that I actually um, had some email correspondence back and forth with him. I actually find it impossible to believe that he was not fully aware of what Wright was doing. You be the judge for yourself as we go through his work. He claims he barely knew the man. Um, Bruce Ricard and Neville Brusman, among many others, were more vocal in their embrace of Wright's theories and styles, um, although each of them brought a new interpretation of Wright to their work. And I think, uh, well, you'll see that pretty clearly as we get to their work as well. So first on to Peter Muller. He was born in Adelaide in 1927 and graduated from the architecture program at the university there in 1948. He was awarded a Fulbright Scholarship for studying in the United States, and he used it to earn a master's degree in architecture at Penn. Well, his first project when he returned to Australia in 1952 was this house, the Audette House, in the Sydney suburb of Castle Crag. So get your map out and see where that is. Um, Castle Crag was, an, was a whole environment that had been developed by a couple, Walter Burley Griffin and Marion Mahoney Griffin, who had both been very close deputies and assistants to Frank Lloyd Wright in America. Um, everyone had Ryans who ever worked with Frank Lloyd Wright. And eventually, their relationship with Wright became strained as well. And on a whim, they decided to enter into the contest uh, to develop, to plan, the new capital for Australia. Sydney wanted to be the capital. Melbourne wanted to be the capital. The compromise was, okay, we'll build a new capital city. It's an international competition. Walter Burley Griffin and Mary Mahoney Griffin enter. They're, they're selected as the winners. So they come to um, Australia in the early, I think around 1911, and stay for about 25 years, basically. But one of their projects was to develop this new, um, this new community north of Sydney and Castle Crag, and so this happens to be, um, uh, surprisingly and coincidentally, where, where Muller builds his first house. In keeping with the overall spirit of Castle Crag, the house was constructed of natural materials. Muller had hoped to use a rustic stone veneer for some of the building, but the client eventually decided it was too expensive. If you look at all the work that the Griffins had done in Castle Crag, they're heavy heavy stone buildings. So as an alternative, and you can see it, I think, a little bit, um, Muller came up with this um, particular treatment of brick where he allowed the mortar to sort of bleed out from the joints, um, and that was uh, his equivalent of sort of a rocky surface. Muller's design for the house grew from the form he envisioned for the living room which he conceived as a space within a truss. And I think you can see that right there. That is the living room. The same angularity on both sides. So this house is characterized by overhanging flat roofs. Sounds familiar. Large windows oriented to maximize light from the north and views to the middle harbor. Kind of sat up a little bit on a hill. And as you can see on that map, and if ever uh, any of you have been to Sydney, Sydney is this great harbor with all these little fingers that go everywhere little hills that go up and down between them, and the houses are always sort of stacked up. Um, that's what Castle Crag was as well. And so many of the houses would be sited in that suburb and other suburbs so that they could have a view of the water. This was no exception. Overall,
the Audet House conveyed, I think, a strong Wrightian influence. In fact, to me, these two buildings seem nearly identical. Um, they have exposed timber trusses, angled entry mason masonry, I think strikingly similar, but of course, Muller contends he knew nothing about Frank Lloyd Wright. This is uh, the rear view of the Audet House. This is looking up from the garage level towards the front entryway. And this, interestingly, I thought that was, this was an interesting counterpoint to bring in. Uh, this is a Wrightian house. In fact, it was sold a few years ago as the uh, most Frank Lloyd Wright house in the state of Georgia. Um, this is a, a house built in 1960 by Robert Green, who had studied with Wright at Taliesin. Um, and so he came back. I mean, when you look at this, it, it, people are getting a lot of the same signals, right, from Wright as they look at his work and are emulating him in very similar ways on uh, multiple continents. Well, Muller's next residential project was a house for his family on Binder Road in Whale Beach, which was completed in 1954. And the design for this house was driven by the site, which became Muller's philosophy moving forward as he designed homes. The main part of the house is this um, L shape, and then there was a covered walk that got you out to this separate building, um, which was his office. There's a lot of cantilevering of these roof levels. Um, the boundary between inside and outside was essentially erased through the use of large areas of floor to ceiling plate glass and mitered glass corners, in fact, to make the corners sort of disappear. And Muller incorporated, even believe it or not, a rock outcrop into the main living space which served to emphasize the natural setting. So let's take a look at a few of these pictures. This is looking up at the bedroom wing from down below. This is his living room. You can see that rock incorporated inside in the living room. This is his study, that building that's sort of separated from the main building. And I think that's probably Muller in there working. This is looking down from street level at the intersection of all the roof planes and the covered walkways. Well, following Muller's Will Beach house, he was hired by a client to design another house on Banya Road. And once again, Muller responded to the site, carefully fit a cruciform plan on the narrow lot. Cruciform plans were very much a writing trope. And once again, he was maximizing the views of the water below. So brick, timber, and glass were the main building materials. Lighting was increased to the interior spaces through the use of Clara stories that often marked the intersections between different wings and crossings of different parts of the house. The Clara stories were incorporated into the main living spaces. That resulted in higher ce ceilings in parts of the building, and then the bedrooms in the private areas tended to have the, um, the smaller or the lower ceilings. So the pair of houses on Binder Road were widely noted at their time of construction. Architecture and Arts, we're looking at it here. A Melbourne-based architecture magazine published a story on Muller's work in December of 1955, putting one of his commercial designs on its cover. And the magazine provided a preface to his drawings. And let me just quote what they said. Um, Mr. Muller, whose work is in the style of famed 87-year-old American architect Frank Lloyd Wright, is the second architect to interpret organic architecture in its true sense in Australia. The first was the late Walter Burley Griffin. Well, although intended to be a compliment, Muller saw the editor's note as suggesting that he was just a copyist of Frank Lloyd Wright and decided to seek a direct evaluation from Wright himself. And so he sent a copy of the magazine to Wright and he received a response from him dated March 20th, 1956. And here's the letter. Um, Muller actually shared this letter with me. And his short letter, Wright's short letter said, my dear Peter Muller, your modern schemes are interesting. I hope to see them put into effect. While I have no present intention of reaching Australia, I do contemplate a trip to Japan sometime this year. If you ever come this way, we will be happy to have you come and see us. Meantime, good luck. 
Interestingly, Mueller considered Wright's response as having vindicated his efforts and validated his self-styled independence, I think, but the fact remained that Mueller's work closely paralleled that of Mr. Wright. There's a great um, book that was compiled by a graduate student in Australia. I can tell you, um, not to uh, tell you the sad story of research, Finding pictures, finding information on this group of architects uh, from the other side of the globe and uh, searching through the few libraries that have anything was, was a real uh, difficult endeavor. Uh, but Mueller was, uh, Mr. Mueller was actually very helpful in giving me some good information. There are a lot of interesting pictures in this book. You can probably see it online if you're interested. There are a lot of great pictures of his works and it just, is a page turn, page after page, you're thinking of Frank Lloyd Wright. So Bruce Ricard, our second uh, architect for tonight, was born in Sydney in 1929, graduated from the architecture program at Sydney Technical College in 1953, and worked during his time as a student in the offices of Sydney Anchor, Anchor, that other noted modernist that I mentioned earlier with Robin Boyd. In 1954, he embarked on an educational journey to Europe and to the United States. He completed a landscape design course at the University College in London, and then he received a fellowship to study landscape architecture at Penn. Well, while in the United States, Ricard traveled and took advantage of the opportunity to see important architectural landmarks, but he really was sort of enamored of Wright, and he focused on Wright. He saw falling water, he saw Taliesin West, he um, collected slides from many of the places he visited, which he regularly showed to friends and colleagues once he returned to Australia. And really, and many uh, sort of comment on this, his slideshows had a big impact on the careers of many in the Australian architectural community. So Ricard opened an architectural practice in Sydney in 1959, and one of the first projects he undertook was the design of a home for his family, which I'm showing you here. Located in Warrawee, the house was, I think, a testament to the impact that Wright had on Ricard's early design direction. So it's known as the Ricard House. The building, I think, has a number of physical characteristics that parallel Taliesin West and other works by Wright. I'm showing you here the main gallery, the garden room at Taliesin West, and the living room of Ricard House. The roof over the main central living space in the Ricard House rises up in a flat, elongated, triangular form, similar to that drafting room at Taliesin West, sits on a band of clerestory windows, which was um, something that you see again and again in Wright's work. Like many of Wright's Usonian houses, which were in fact particularly admired by Ricard, the house had a variety of roof planes that intersected and overlaid each other. And I'm showing you in sort of comparison the Alvin Miller house by Wright in Charles City, Iowa. And an abundance of glass allowed for a unity with the natural surroundings and the substantial natural light that came in. Deep, deep roof overhangs then provided protection from the sun in the summer. So I don't know how many of you know how to read a plan, an architectural plan like this, but I'm just going to point out a few things to give you a sense for how much glass was on this building. So when you see solid lines, can people see my pointer? Okay, so when you see these solid lines, that is generally a solid wall. Here's one right here. Here's one right here. All of these other walls are some configuration of windows with mullions. And then, of course, these are floor to ceiling glass areas and doors opening to the outside onto a variety of terraces. But you can get the sense this is a house that is very much open to the outside. Well, the house was constructed of stone, timber, and con concrete, and the materials were used abundantly on both the exterior and the interior walls, which firmly anchored this building to its site. And like I said, erased some of the distinction between the outside and the inside. Now on the back of your map, um, there are a number of images about that are from this house. I tried to pull them up under the slide presentation, but they uh, degraded so severely that I thought, you know what, we'll just hand out this 
this piece from the uh, from the uh, architectural history um, files of Australia. You can take a look at some of those interior shots in particular. Well, in a later reflection that highlighted his lifelong passion for landscape architecture, Ricard described his approach. I'm going to just give you a sentence or two on what he said. I care about the relationship of building to the site environment. Okay, that sounds very much like right. My approach is to integrate the building with the site for the building to reflect and emphasize in form, materials, and color the dominant character of the site environment. You could almost hear that sentence, that sequence of sentences coming out of Wright's mouth. And in fact, um, you know, I brought a copy of a book that Wright wrote, The Natural House, in 1954. And in that book, Wright goes through all of his, uh, all of his design principles for residential housing, for his prairie houses, for his Usonian houses, sort of subscribed to all the same tenets throughout his life. And that could have read as an architectural guidebook for these Sydney architects, particularly for someone like um, Bruce Ricard. Another early design by Ricard was a house in Castle Hill for John and Judy Reed. And I apologize for the, um, for the clarity of this image, but their house was completed in 1963. And they, the Reeds, were captivated by the home featured in Alfred Hitchcock's movie, North by Northwest, especially the interior stone walls. And they provided a series of movie stills to Ricard, and these movie stills collectively served as the starting point for his design for their house. Well, in fact, Hitchcock had wanted the house in his movie to look like it had been designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. So clearly the Reed's design sensibilities were clearly in line with Ricard's. So uh, as you look around on the internet, there are a lot of pictures from North by Northwest, all of them of similar bad quality to blow up this large. So I apologize for that. We'll look at two more um, that are different angles on the living room space in the Van Damme house in North by Northwest. Well, so the Reed House is situated on the edge of a ridge, just like the house, the Van Damme House. Um, it's organized in an L-shaped plan. So I've highlighted the interior space, which if you didn't get it, that was exactly what I did on the Ricard House as we looked at that as well. The main living areas are located at the intersection of the two arms, so right in here, with the longer wing, wing facing the Blue Mountains to the west and the shorter wing oriented to the north for sunlight. So in the northern hemisphere, we orient towards the south for sunlight. In the southern hemisphere, you orient to the north for sunlight. So once again, we're seeing these clerestory windows um, raising portions of the roof above the general roof line. And along with skylights, there's a lot of sunlight coming into this interior, the interior of this house. The materials used in construction include Ricard's typical pallet of timber, brick, and stone. Overall, I think the building blends convincingly to its site. Here's another look at the different roof planes and the Clara story windows. Once again, I apologize for these pictures, but there just are so few available. Um, and very few books, quite frankly, um, on these architects as well. And then this is a shot of the living room of the Reed House. And so you can begin to recognize not only similarities with other of Ricard's work, but similarities with some of the things that you all know about the work of Wright. And there's just a comparison. There's that interior stonework that the Reeds were so enamored of in the movie. And there they have it in their own living room. Well, in 1965, Ricard designed the Resenseff House for Wally Resenseff and his wife, who were both commercial artists working in the advertising agency world in Sydney. And the Resenseffs had bought a steep piece of land in Castle Cove, once again, refer to your map, that many had considered to be unbuildable, was characterized by large natural sandstone boulders and outcroppings of rocks. The Resenseffs were as well enamored of Ricard's work and engaged him as their architect. So this house is spread over three levels, constructed of brick and timber, 
The center level features a large cantilever deck and typical of Ricard's work, there was a free flow between indoor and outdoor space with the house, I think, in constant conversation with its surroundings. Ricard focused on residential architecture throughout his career. I just wanted to put up a, a house that, that was a right house in Bloomfield Hills, also very much a Usonian uh, flavor. Uh, which I think bears a lot of similarity, once again, to this particular house by Ricard. Well, Ricard's early design, design staked him, I think, as nearly an Australian branch of the Taliesin Fellowship, but his approach incorporated significant differences that also set him apart from Wright. His designs were more open to the outdoors, were less embracing and enclosing than Wright's were, and some say maybe represented an approach that was a bit more optimistic than Wright's approach was. His designs were driven as much by the site as Wright's were, but they always had a northern orientation and incorporated, in Ricard's work, incorporated carefully calculated roof overhangs designed to admit light in the winter, but to make sure it modulated the light that came in in the summer. Our last architect tonight is Neville Bruceman. He was born in Sydney in 1925 and studied architecture at the University of Sydney, exploring the work of Le Corbusier and Mies van der Rohe. And after his graduation, of course, with those two as sort of uh, uh, real role models for him, he set off to Europe with a friend and visited many important architectural sites. And when he returned, he set up an architectural practice in Sydney. Well, in 1955, Grusman went to Japan for a four and a half month visit. He was actually invited by the Japanese government and became one of the first Australian architects to visit Japan following the war. He spent time in all the typical places. He was in Tokyo, Kyoto, Nara, and he was drawn, much like Wright was, to traditional Japanese architecture and gardens and design. His explorations included a visit to Wright's Imperial Hotel in Tokyo, where he marveled at the landmark and wrote that, he said this, if ever space truly flowed and wrapped itself around its people, it was in the public rooms and gardens of this building. So for Guzman, overall the visit was transformational. He returned to Sydney, anxious to put into practice the ideas he had developed on that Japanese trip and through his Japanese experiences. And so his first project on return was a house in the Sydney suburb of Middle Cove. The Goodman House and Grusman's design board in 1956 reflected an architectural approach that had been transformed. Remember, this is the guy who went to Europe really seeking that modernist approach to architecture and then he goes to um, he goes to Japan and he's changed. The construction was of dark stained brick and timber and the northernmost corner of the roof of the house rose up like a pagoda. It was oriented toward the north to take full advantage of the sun and the windows covered the entire northeast and northwest facades which opened the house up to its very lush surroundings looking at it there from a different angle. And comparing it right here to um, another one of Wright's houses in Minnesota, the Elam House. Grusman's style would continue to evolve and be inflected with additional influences from Frank Lloyd Wright. So when Bruce Ricard returned to Australia in 1958, remember it's a small community, among those architects. He and Grusman, along with several others, spent two days going through and absorbing Ricard's slides of the work of Wright, which he'd accumulated as he traveled across America. Grusman was struck by Wright's manipulation of masses and this interplay of spatial compression and release, and he embraced the effect in his own work. And it's particularly evident in this house. We won't get to go all the way through it, but this house, the uh, Saul's house in Mossman, was designed by Guzman in 1960. 
And here he incorporated a bunch of writing themes, such as the pinwheel plan, where space radiates out from a double height central living space and a central fireplace, and then repetitive stands of deep and shallow brick piers, which you can see there. Overhanging roofs, sometimes perforated with a pattern of openings. Has anybody ever visited a right house where you've seen in those overhanging roofs those perforations that sort of let sun in? It was very much sort of um, Wright's way of maybe sometime taking back what he meant when he put those big roof overhangs in. He didn't want to always block out on the sun. Sometimes he wanted to let sun in. And so just a few more pictures of the Saul's house. It's an exterior shot. This is inside in the living room as you come down the steps into a big space. You can sort of feel how you might have been a little bit compressed as you were up the steps. You come down the steps and this space opens up for you. That's the study off a courtyard inside the walls. Well, in 1962, Grusman convinced the Lend-Lease Corporation to give him three adjoining sites at the Carlingford Home Fair. Uh, much like what was going on in America post-war, in Australia, uh, same thing was happening. Maybe with slightly more urgency because this was a country that was sort of building itself up from nothing. Population was expanding, housing was in real, uh, there was a real shortage of housing. So this Carlingford Home Fair was a place where a lot of architects put up houses and it was really experimental in what kind of house might be appropriate in the Australian landscape. Well, what what Grusman wanted to do was for the Lend Lease Corporation to allow him to experiment with the arrangement of multiple houses and the relationship between, it, between them. So he got three lots, and once again, he deployed brick piers in, in both the houses and the pergolas that unified them architecturally on the site. So in this particular slide, you can see some of those pergolas going back and forth, and then those strong brick piers uh, at the end of one of the houses kind of framing out uh, a bit of a porch under that overhang. Well, during this period, Grusman was able to break away from his practice and make his first trip to the United States. And one of his goals for that trip was to personally experience the work of Frank Lloyd Wright. And he wrote about the impact of the experience and on his understanding of the interconnectivity of design approaches. And I want to just read you, once again, a quick little paragraph of what he said. Wright's buildings revealed an incredible inventiveness, creativity, and pioneering quality. As with my Japanese experience, this trip had a powerful influence on my architectural thinking. What is notable is the Japanese architecture and that of Rice, Wright and Mies van der Rohe have elements in common. I've been influenced by all three. So he's beginning to synthesize a bit. Well, a second trip to the United States followed in 1963 and was devoted to a further exploration of Wright's work. He traveled around, he visited Unity Temple, Falling Water, and houses in Oak Park, and in California. And he said afterwards that he found the entire exercise, that whole visit, to be a quote unquote revelation. Grusman's 1966 home for Sam Rosenberg in Turamura was a synthesis of the influences of Wright, Mies, and Japan. So essentially, we're looking here at a glass pavilion raised up on the ground on thin concrete planes. Grusman's bringing together here, I think, two icons of 20th century architecture, Wright's Falling Water and Mies van der Rohe's Farnsworth House in Plano, Illinois. So here's Grusman's house in Turamura. The site included delicate gardens and ponds, arched bridge over a waterfall, right? Thinking about that waterfall, that falling water. Um, and then the zen of a Japanese garden. Right, we didn't get much into it, but Wright was very much an aficionado of, of Japanese, all things Japanese, really. In fact, um, I don't know if you know David Lieberson. He's one of our board members here at the Muscarelli. Well, his parents, started a Japanese print gallery in New York decades ago. And I remember his father telling me about one of the first big acquisitions they made, which was a collection, uh, or part of the collection of Frank Wood Wright's woodblock prints. And he said the problem with, with 
with rights collections where he occasionally would take license and if a color was missing where he thought a color should be, sort of color in on those woodblock prints. So you really had to kind of work through them to make sure you weren't selling something that was uh, tainted, although I'll be tainted by somewhat of a master, right? Well, just in summary, while Frank Lloyd Wright never traveled to Australia, his work was known to architects there through a variety of means. Architectural publications were one source, but I think more important were the architects who traveled to America in the 1950s and 1960s and made it their mission to view and to understand his work. Wright's idea of an organic architecture had a particular resonance in a modernizing country that was seeking to uncover its architectural guideposts while preserving its natural heritage. I mean, natural is really the watchword in Australia. So in reality, the search that ultimately found Wright was a search for modern architectural expression and vocabulary. Different architects, we've looked at just three of them here tonight, but there are probably about 15 of them we could have included in this presentation, but different architects chose different paths and the search for a modern and continually evolving architecture was in some ways no different than similar searches that were being conducted both here in the United States, but also in Europe. Not all architects embraced right or right in forms and theories. Like America, and we discussed this a couple of years ago, there were regional and even sub-regional differences in how the question of modern architecture was actually answered. But in Sydney, I think there was a clear embrace of right in its approach to residential architecture among some architects. A number of these architects regularly expressed the primacy of site and the careful fit of architecture to that site. Standard right building features, such as multi-planar flat roofs, steep roof overhangs, natural materials, such as stone, timber, and brick, Centrally located fireplaces, you're always seeing those in right buildings. Plans that radiated out from those fireplaces, an abundance of windows and skylights, a generally tight fit of the building to the ground were broadly embraced and quite frankly, they were all right. The controversial naming of what Robin Boyd did, a Sydney School of Architecture, was an attempt to group some architects into a right and true, but there was really no central driving force behind any kind of a movement. Many of Wright's disciples that practiced residential architectural design in the greater Sydney area were more focused on their individual practices than they were in developing any kind of group dynamics or group think. They clearly recognized similarities in their approaches to residential problems clearly understood when their design style was parallel to a fellow practitioner. They were in dialogue, um, but in general, they took from right the elements that fit best with their own design sensibilities. I think you'll agree with me. There is a common thread that comes through all of this, but the result in the end between these different architects was not generic. It was not necessarily Frank Lloyd Wright writ large, but it was Frank Lloyd Wright influencing their work. So thank you very much. If there, if there are any questions, we might have time for one or two, or else you can come and find me afterwards. All right, I'm coming to you next, but I'm going to go to Martha Jean first. Martha Jean? I think definitely. I think I, I think when you are looking at someone who's constructing in the school of let's say a Frank Lloyd Wright style, you are actively considering the interior and the exterior. So we all know houses, and many of us may have built houses over time um, where we find a lot. Um, maybe there's a house we have to get rid of before we build our new house, and we plop our house down, and then we begin to develop the outside as it wraps around um, the building that we've just built. But I think when you're talking about 
these Australian practitioners who were so concerned about the natural surroundings, and clearly when you're talking about right, you were talking about a house that has both an inside experience and an outside experience. Right houses often have many terraces that are um, radiating out in different directions, so very much a consideration. And for someone studying architecture uh, that wants to practice in a way that Frank Lloyd Wright was building residential houses, uh, studying maybe even in the degree program landscape architecture is a perfect fit. John? Uh, David, uh, there are many uh, stories uh, told uh, uh, by the inhabitants of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright houses about quirks and impracticalities. Um, did you come across any uh, sort of stories from the people who lived in these houses? No, but I think it's really interesting what you bring up. Um, Wright is famous for having had many, many fights with his residential clients because he wanted to design the whole house. Uh, he would occasionally walk into a house that had just recently been completed and new residents had moved in and he would find a piece of furniture that wasn't designed by him. And immediately the fireworks would ensue and there would be big arguments. In fact, he fell out with several of his clients um, permanently because of fights they had regarding things like that. And I think a lot of times what people were doing was, um, was trying to make the houses, the right houses, slightly more livable. Like they didn't necessarily like where he built the couch in. Uh, they wanted to maybe have a seat that was a little closer to the fireplace or a little bit further away from the fireplace. And so they would try to customize. I, I didn't get the sense in any of the work that I did that that was what these, uh, these architects in Australia were trying to do. And if you looked at some of those interior spaces, we didn't see that many, you didn't really see many of those built-in corner couches like you would typically see in a right house. You know, also, I'll tell you, uh, for those of you who have visited the right houses, you've probably seen some of the many, uh, many plywood pieces of furniture that he had strewn about, uh, about these houses that he built in his own workshop. So these people are spending all this time to work with a master on developing their house, and he's building in some of the couches, and then he'll leave you with five plywood angular chairs, which aren't necessarily, wouldn't necessarily have been your first choice on furniture selection for the space. So um, I think it, it was different in that way, but a pretty question. Anything else? Well, thank you so much for being here. And please come and talk to me.